I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, the 21st Century Business Herald and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences for the opportunity to address all of you today. I wish I could be there, but this is the closest substitute for that. The first thing I want to say at the outset is to congratulate the project that is dealing with chief climate officers here in China. I think it's noteworthy and represents an important step by the Chinese corporates that are here and others that are not to deal with pressing environmental problems. I'd like to begin by offering you a hypothesis or a theory of the case about value creation. If we look at the United States from the end of the Second World War to 1970, value was created in manufacturing. It represented a significant part of the world GDP and the US GDP. The value proposition changed in the decade of the 70s. Two Arab oil embargoes, crop failures in Russia and China, soaring gold prices, all led to a value proposition tied to inflation. The decade of the 80s was the commoditization of financial instruments, not commodities themselves. We learned how to manage interest rate risk. Financial futures emerged. The mortgage-backed security emerged. Even bank loans were commoditized. They were known as junk bonds, but nevertheless, they financed people who had no access to the capital markets. Ted Turner and Cable News Network, a bold new experiment. McGaw Cellular, Terry McGaw and a cell phone. Bill McGowan competing with AT&T, with MCI. All were done through the commoditization of bank debt. The decade of the 90s began with the commoditization of data and information. Cisco went public in 1990. Mosaic was started in the middle of that decade. This ultimately led to the birth of the World Wide Web, ultimately followed by search engines, Google, social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc. The hypothesis that I'd like you to consider today is that the next big value creation will be a very different sort of commoditization the commoditization of air and water. These are, after all, the most important commodities in the world. When we have a problem like pollution, whether it's airborne or waterborne, we've got several ways to deal with it. One of them is termed command and control. In that instance, you just order certain things to be done very specifically at very, very different plants. One size fits all. On the other hand, there's something called flexible mechanisms. One where you cap the emissions, but instead of prescribing what each factory must do, the factories collectively have to reduce emissions, for example, by 10%. If one particular company can do it by 20 because they have a cost advantage, then they're incentivized to cut more than the 10% and then sell any reductions in the market. Alternatively, if, if another company can't install technology for years, it can hedge itself by buying somebody else's excess reductions. This is known, once again, as cap and trade, and I know is actively being discussed here in China. The first global application of cap and trade was to deal with acid rain in the United States. During the 80s, we had about 18 million tons of emissions. 
those were cut by more than 50% to the current level of 9 million tons. And this was done through a cap and trade system. Acid rain, which had once the subject of movies and popular press, has disappeared as a problem in the United States. The EPA suggests that the cost of that program was roughly a billion to two billion dollars, and the medical benefits alone this year will be $123 billion, an incredible cost-benefit ratio from the point of view of an economist. Consider those same numbers for China. China currently emits 26 million tons of SO2. If it could cut by nine or 18 million dollars, it could have roughly 250 billion dollars of reduction in medical expenses. If we allow for the fact that China has four times the population density of the United States, those benefits could reach 750 billion to a trillion dollars, significantly more of a gain than even the United States because of the population density. China has other problems that can be dealt with in a similar way. They include carbon intensity, they include NOx, they include clean water, they include a quantity and quality of water, all of which could be markets that could be addressed. We started this in the United States and started a company called the Chicago Climate Exchange that dealt with acid rain, that dealt with NOx, and most importantly, dealt with carbon. It was a voluntary program. It had 17% of the Dow Jones. It had a 11% of the Fortune Top 100, 25% of the power companies, IBM, DuPont, Intel, Honeywell, Ford, American Electric Power, et cetera. These members, on a voluntary basis, reduced emissions by over 400 million tons in the last six years, more than the entire emissions of a country like France. That same model could easily be applied in China. The 12th five-year plan suggests a reduction of carbon intensity of 40 to 45 percent. Numerous ministries, including the NDRC, have talked about this and the possibility of using a cap-and-trade model. We've dedicated ourselves to spending a lot of time in China, 20 visits in the last five years. We partnered with the China National Petroleum Corporation and Tianjin to set up the Tianjin Climate Exchange. It is my unambiguous belief that China has a chance to be a world leader in using market-based solutions to environmental problems. Simon Kuznets, the great economist, in something called the Kuznets Curve, indicated that when countries get wealthy enough, they will turn their attention to the environment. And I think that's exactly where China is these very days. It's very important to emphasize that this technology, cap and trade, a financial technology, should be redeveloped and redefined in a Chinese way done by Chinese practitioners in order to meet Chinese objectives. It shouldn't simply be an adaptation of what is done elsewhere. I firmly believe in China and its future. I believe in the miracle. I believe the miracle can be accompanied by a clean, cleaner world, one where there are no deaths from children, from contaminated water, where there's no respiratory problems, from acid rain, and one in which the true Chinese nature 
can be expressed in the love of both air and water. I have taken it as a personal mission to come to China often. I've just had the privilege of being employed by the Peking University's Guanghua School of Management as a distinguished adjunct professor. I will be coming there to teach how to use markets to achieve social objectives. Thank you very much. It's indeed a promising conference. I appreciate the opportunity of being here today with all of you by video, and I will be seeing many of the friends in this audience at some time in the near future. Shay Shay.